This section begins the intermediate level training. We'll take a look at what this DNP3 secure authentication look like and how does it behave. This section is targeted for a technologist or a technician. In practice, the core of the DNP3 secure authentication mechanism is three new function codes shown here. Almost every security message will use one of these function codes. This permits non-secure devices to clearly identify that the secure devices are using a feature that it does not support and raise a configuration error. Authentication can take place in either direction. Not only can an outstation verify that a control operation is authentic, for example, but a master can also verify that the data it's receiving from the outstation is authentic. The specification includes a list of which items are mandatory to be authenticated. For instance, controls must be authenticated, but it's optional whether data responses from the outstation are authenticated by the master. Each individual device has the choice of what must be authenticated for its proper operation. There are eight new objects defined for use with basic authentication. Note that all the objects except those related to key exchange can be sent by either the master or the outstation. A challenge message is sent by a receiver to indicate that the previously transmitted message must be authenticated. The challenger supplies data to be included in the authentication calculation. A reply message contains the MAC used to authenticate a message. An aggressive mode request and a MAC object, HMAC or GMAC, are included at the start and end of a DNP3 fragment respectively to authenticate a message without exchanging as challenge and reply. There are two types of keys that are used in DNP3 secure authentication. The pre-shared key already discussed, known as the update key, and a session key in each direction. The update key is used to periodically change the session key using the three session key messages. An optional error message can be used for debugging a secure system to determine why authentication is failing. Devices can stop sending error messages at any time to avoid denial of service attacks. This slide shows the update key change objects that are sent as variations of group 120, as well as whether they are transmitted by the master, the outstation, or either. This slide shows the statistics objects. These objects are contained in groups 121 for static values and group 122 for events and are sent by the outstation. DNP3 secure authentication is by default based on a challenge reply mechanism. Either the master or the outstation can challenge any normal DNP3 message it receives. The receiver of the message can determine that any DNP3 function is critical, requiring authentication. However, the specification does specify that certain functions must be considered critical, such as control operations, select, operate, direct operate, etc. This picture shows an example of a select operation. The master transmits the select as a normal DNP3 message. However, instead of transmitting a normal select response, the outstation sends a challenge message using the authentication response function code and the authentication challenge object. The authentication challenge object contains pseudo-random data that both ends must use in their calculation of the message authentication code, or MAC. This random data, along with extended sequence numbers in the messages, help to protect against replay attacks. The attacker would have to not only determine the appropriate sequence number for the moment of the attack, but also guess the random data to be used. This is exceedingly difficult because the receiver of the original message, in this case the outstation, chooses the random data. In this example, the master sends an authentication reply object in reply to the challenge. Since the DNP3 terminology of request and response still applies, this reply object is transmitted using an authentication request function code. This may be confusing, but it helps to remember that in DNP3, masters always transmit requests and outstations always transmit responses. The authentication reply object contains the MAC, which the outstation will compare to the one it calculates internally. If the MAC is valid, the outstation replies with the control relay output block, or CROB, response that the master was originally expecting. Note that DNP3 sequence number rules continue to apply. The entire select sequence uses the same DNP3 sequence number, in this case 8, including the challenge and the reply. Note also that the select was preceded by a read operation, which the outstation considered to be non-critical and therefore did not challenge. Because the complete challenge reply sequence adds several messages to a DNP3 transaction, the secure authentication specification permits devices to use an aggressive mode in which the sender assumes the message will be challenged and transmits a MAC in the same message that is being authenticated. Here is an example of a select operate sequence using aggressive mode. The master sends a message with a select function code and a CROB object as before, but precedes the CROB with an aggressive mode request object 
and follows it with a MAC object. The outstation authenticates this MAC and sends a normal select response. The operate sequence is similar, except that the DNP3 sequence number is incremented and an operate function code is used as usual. Aggressive mode must be supported by all DNP3 secure authentication implementations and will likely be very commonly used. However, it cannot be used exclusively. Before it can be used, the two devices must first perform a challenge reply sequence. This is required so that the master, in this case, has the appropriate pseudo-random data in order to calculate the MAC. This does not provide an equal level of replay protection to a complete challenge reply, but it's still probably adequate while significantly reducing the amount of bandwidth required. This diagram illustrates how objects and headers are arranged when using aggressive mode. The application header and the objects in between the aggressive mode request and MAC objects are standard DNP3 objects. The qualifier used for the authentication objects is 1B hex, which permits test sets that do not understand the security messages to skip over the unknown objects if they choose. There are two types of keys used in basic DNP3 secure authentication, as described in DNP3 SAV2. Both must be at least 128 bits in length. The session key is the key used in the MAC calculations. A new session key is created every time two devices begin communicating and is periodically changed by the master. In a typical real-time SCADA system acquiring data from outstations every two seconds, session keys should be changed on the order of every 10 to 15 minutes, perhaps an hour at the most. Distribution SCADA systems using dial-up systems and gathering data every hour or every day would naturally change them much less frequently, perhaps once a week. The specification states that session keys may be renewed either when a configured interval has passed or when a configured number of messages have been exchanged. There are two session keys used, one in each direction. The update key is the key used by the master to encrypt the session keys each time they are initialized or changed. The update key is the pre-shared key previously discussed. DNP3 SAV5 provides a method to manage the update keys remotely. The update key uses the advanced encryption standard, AES, to encrypt the session keys so they cannot be viewed by an attacker as they are downloaded to the outstation. This encryption, plus the frequent changing of session keys, prevents attackers from analyzing the traffic to guess the session key in time for it to be usable. The key change transaction uses a challenge reply sequence like the normal authentication mechanism. The master requests the status of the keys, the outstation replies with the status and challenge data, after which the master may choose to reset the keys. The key change transaction uses a challenge reply sequence like the normal authentication mechanism. The master requests the status of the keys, the outstation replies with the status and challenge data, after which the master may choose to reset the keys. The final response from the outstation shows that the keys are okay and provides challenge data for the next exchange if desired. This diagram illustrates how the outstation changes the status of the keys and the master resets the keys after a communication failure occurs. This diagram shows how a master would typically initialize secure communications with an outstation. The outstation generates an unsolicited response to notify the master that it has restarted according to the normal rules of DNP3 unsolicited responses. Rather than confirm the unsolicited response, the master first initializes the session keys. Again, by the rules of unsolicited responses, the outstation is required to abandon the original unsolicited response in favor of the session key transaction. Then, when the outstation reattempts the restart unsolicited response, the master challenges and authenticates the response before supplying a confirmation. The outstation does not require authentication of the master's confirm. However, the outstation does challenge the write operation to clear the restart IIN. Following this sequence, both sides are permitted to use the aggressive mode because a complete challenge reply sequence has taken place in both directions. Error messages report various types of failures and are often used for debugging. Error messages include a text message and a timestamp and can be sent on an alternate link. An error message usually means that one end was misconfigured, although they could indicate some type of an attack. Consequently, the specification requires that they stop being sent after a threshold has been reached. Most of DNP3 secure authentication is concerned with preventative measures. However, it also includes some detective measures in order to attempt to identify if an attack is underway. The specification defines three new objects for security. Security statistic, security statistic change event, and security statistic change event with time. These objects are very similar to counter objects. DNP3 secure authentication defines a fixed set of point numbers for statistics. Each statistic point represents a different measured quantity, 
reports both static and event objects at the appropriate times, and has its events assigned to a class, just like other DNP3 objects. Statistic points also have a predefined transmission threshold for event objects because too many events may, but does not necessarily, indicate that an attack is underway. In addition, some statistics have predefined maximums that when exceeded cause the device to take some other action. Statistics may be reported on other links, which allows another DNP3 master to discover the problem. Note that statistics counters may wrap, but they are never reset to zero. This slide and the next slide provide a list of statistic point numbers, along with the default threshold and additional actions that may be taken. In DNP3 Secure Authentication version 2, or DNP3 SAV2, update keys were pre-shared. DNP3 SAV5 adds the ability to change the update keys remotely. This capability is optional and requires the use of an authority. The authority cannot be the master itself and must support symmetric key management. It may optionally support asymmetric key management and optionally be an asymmetric certificate authority. The authority must communicate securely with the master. The methods of implementing the authority is outside the scope of DNP3. The most likely solution to this impasse is that the DNP3 specification will identify symmetric cryptography as mandatory and identify public or asymmetric cryptography as optional for changing update keys. In either case, the sequence shown in this diagram is likely to be used. In the proposed method, an authority which is not the master or the outstation will certify whether users are to be accepted by the outstation. Communications between the authority and the master must be secure but are out of the scope of DNP3. They're shown in dotted lines. The certificate or token supplied by the authority will be passed through the master without alteration by the master. The outstation will first verify that the certification is valid and then authenticate the master that is sending it. Using the asymmetric option, the outstation would validate the new user using the authority's public key. Using the symmetric option, there would be a pre-shared key installed at the outstation that was only shared between the outstation and the authority and only used when an update key needed changing. In either case, the message sequence used is very similar and DNP3 objects will be used in common whenever possible. The reason this topic is so controversial is a matter of risk and cost. Risk in that it is much more likely that update keys would be compromised by someone leaving a utility organization than by an attacker cracking the keys on the link. Cost in that there are a large number of devices in the typical SCADA system and the distribution of new keys to all these sites by hand would be prohibitive. Therefore, an electronic mechanism is necessary. Public key encryption is currently the approved mechanism in the computer industry for reducing this risk and cost. However, the utility industry has topology and processing power concerns that may make public key cryptography excessively costly. This table shows a comparison between asymmetric or public key cryptography and symmetric or pre-shared key cryptography. The main argument against asymmetric keys is that they require 10 to 100 times as much processing power than symmetric cryptography on the device that uses them. The main argument against symmetric keys is that they must be kept absolutely secret at all times, while public keys can be transmitted in the clear, posted on a website, passed in an email, or entered by hand. Only the private key of the private public key pair must be kept secret. This gives asymmetric cryptography an advantage in key distribution. A white paper is available from the DNP3 Technical Committee discussing this comparison in more detail. The DNP3 specification permits remote key update changes using symmetric cryptography, asymmetric cryptography using dedicated DNP3 objects, and asymmetric cryptography using IEC 62351-8 or X.509 certificates. A master or outstation may choose to use configured update keys only and not permit remote update key changes. It may also implement only symmetric methods, or it may implement both symmetric and asymmetric methods. DNP3 Secure Authentication assumes that the master may have many users. Each user has his or her own currently active session key in each direction. In addition, each user has an update key for changing the session keys, a username, which is a text string, a public key if asymmetric encryption is used, and a role, for example, an operator or an engineer. Each role has its own set of privileges, such as reading data, operating controls, or executing file transfers. Each role assignment has an expiry interval as well. The authority decides which users an outstation must accept, which roles, and therefore privileges, a user may have, 
and how long the user's privileges last. The master passes the authority's choices to the appropriate outstations and cannot modify these choices. The outstation authenticates the master and the authority, enforces the authority's choices, and assigns a short user number to each user. A user number represents a particular person. However, many functions are performed by the master on behalf of all users. Note that a user number is valid only on one distinct association. That is, the same user can be assigned different user numbers on different links. The outstation doesn't know which user it is challenging. Some utilities may not want to track individual users. Their argument is that the master authenticates the user, the outstation authenticates the master, the master logs all operations performed by the user, and so it's not necessary for the outstation to authenticate the user. Therefore, single user systems are permitted. In such cases, the master always uses the user number one, default, and the username, common. Authentication verifies that you are who you say you are. Authorization relates to which operations you have the right to perform. For example, are you permitted to only read data, or are you permitted to send controls as well? There are three factors. Something you know, for example, a password or personal identification number or PIN. Something you have, for example, a smart card or USB token. Or something unique to you, for example, a signature, a fingerprint, or a voice print. Ideally, systems use more than one factor at a time. For example, using a debit card requires both your card and PIN, or using a credit card requires both your card and your signature. Role-based authentication control is a concept in key management that is complementary to authentication. A role, such as administrator, operator, engineer, or technician, is assigned to each person. Each role has certain privileges. For example, some roles may only be permitted to read data, whereas other roles may also be permitted to send controls. Role-based authentication provides centralized management of roles, which helps simplify authorization and, since it eliminates the need to keep track of which users are assigned which rights, role-based authentication control also makes it easier to revoke rights and helps keep roles consistent across the organization. DNP3 makes use of standardized roles and privileges. This slide shows a variety of user roles. These roles are aligned with those in IEC 62351-8. This table is from the Secure Authentication Test Procedures, which as of the time of this recording, July 2014, are still in process. This table shows items that need to be configured in order for secure authentication to work correctly, along with typical values. These items typically need to be configured the same way on both the master and the outstation. This table shows typical threshold values. The max items affect the behavior of the system and should be chosen carefully. The statistics thresholds only apply to the outstation since the master does not report statistics. A master just needs some way to display them. Finally, let's look at some of the responsibilities of the utility. These include ensuring that DNP3 secure authentication is used where it's required and ensuring that the correct version is used. That is SAV2 or SAV5. They should use SAV5 if it's supported. The utility is also responsible for making design and policy choices regarding whether to use pre-shared or remotely updated keys, whether to use symmetric or asymmetric, and if asymmetric, whether to use certificates or non-certificates, and whether to use single-user or multi-user mode. If a certificate is used, the utility is responsible for determining whether to use internal or external certificate authority. In addition, the utility is responsible for establishing a master authority relationship, communications, and security policy identifying critical functions to be protected, and assigning roles to users and determining expiry times and revocation procedures. The utility is also responsible for ensuring the configuration parameters, such as timers and key sizes match, ensuring keys and certificates are installed for each outstation, ensuring all non-public keys are protected and kept secret, and for creating and deploying training for all staff.